In a way, both, because I had been waiting to come up with an idea that clearly lent itself to traditional animation for a while. And, you know, I like to first come up with an idea and then ask the question, what's the best medium? Most times the answer is 3D. Sometimes the answer is live action, actually. That happens. Like, oh, it's a great idea, but it turns out it would actually be better to be maybe a TV series in live action. I have a drawer for live action ideas that just, okay, guess I won't make those, you know, because <laughs> they that's when they end up but rarely you have a project in mind that clearly would benefit insanely from being done in traditional animation. I've been waiting for that. So when it came about, I realized Klaus could be that project, and I said, okay, how do we make this great now? So, and that's when we said, let's not just do a nostalgic thing, let's see how we can push the medium forward, how we can, you know, all that R&D that hasn't been made because all those 15 years of not having any high-end 2D films, you know, can we catch up for all that time? Can do, what would we be doing today if things have just continued as normal, right? So yeah, it kind of went that way. Well, I was actually, I came out of a bit of a round trip on that one because it was, it was, I was looking, I was inspired by origin stories. Remember that trend in the early 2000s that we have Batman Begins and that Hannibal and you know, Jason, you know, and every, every character was getting an origin story all of a sudden, right? And I, it wasn't always done right, but there was a few instances like Batman Begins where he's like, that's a, such a great storytelling exercise. You take a, a well-established character um, with all its lore and mythology and everything that may have become a bit outdated and you bring it to today's audience and that exercise of doing that felt like an interesting exercise to me so i made a list of all these any character me literary historical fiction that i could think of that might be missing an origin story so you would find names like dracula napoleon or whatever like that in the list and then i came across santa claus and i I kind of shrug it off. I said, that's not, that doesn't sound like a cool film. I, that sounds very sappy to me. Like, I don't want to do that film. But then I kept, it kept coming back. Like, how come Santa doesn't have an origin story? How is that possible, right? And, um, and I, more than as an actual story, a film, it was more of a story than an exercise. I said, I'm going to give myself that assignment. Like, how would you do this? And I do that often. I give myself tough assignments to try and exercise the storytelling muscle, right? So I, I thought, let me try and figure out how, if I had to do this, I could. And in doing so, I actually ended up stumbling into a story that I actually wanted to make into a film. Right? At any given time, there's like eight or nine ideas floating and they can be there for years sometimes. And sometimes they never get out, like, because you have a notion. Like, the speak of me was in that ether for a couple of years before it became a story. And all I had was like, I'd love to make a movie where the villain was the protagonist. That's, and it was just floating there, right? And it doesn't gel into a story until you find, um, usually the irony. It's the irony that makes it happen for me. Like, uh, um, and in, in the Speakable Me was like, well, what if in the quest to, you know, become the world biggest villain, this guy ends up becoming the biggest father, right? So how do you, you know, how do you make that work, right? And in Klaus, it was like, well, what if everything that's great and good about Santa actually came about through the actions of the biggest asshole you could imagine, right? So you find that and then you test, does that have heart? Does that have an interesting kind of arc that have possibilities and then a strong engine and if you do answer those questions then you found the basic premise and you can start working and that's when you would say let me write an outline of that but until then i don't start writing until i know what story i'm going to try to attempt to tell or at least what's the goal for it you know otherwise i never start before i know what the ending is it's just there's i, I I've seen that happen too much where we are trying to figure out the ending as we are in production. I'm like, what? how would we get here? How do you even, you know, even start if you don't know where you're going, right? We had to adapt to the new times in a few ways. Like uh, there's a few disciplines where you can still find talent, 
or where you actually find new talent. There's actually a whole generation of 2D animators that chose that path, even though it would seem like it would be a much smarter way to invest in CGI, but they're just going out of passion, just like I did when I started. And it was not a smart decision to go into animation when I started, but it's something I had to do, and that's the same path they're following. But there's all the disciplines that you just don't find anymore. They disappear, and the whole knowledge is also almost gone. We had lots of trouble finding a layout team because nobody does layout traditionally anymore. And what we ended up doing is we kept finding that the closest thing to a layout artist we could find was a concept designer, a concept development artist, right? And we had to bring all this, you know, a lot of them very young kids, you know, and train them to the layout. But um, there was no point in, in separating layout and background anymore because I think when that separation existed, it had a lot to do with your choice of tools. Like, are you a pencil guy or are you a paint a paintbrush guy, right? But now, you know, since we're doing everything digitally, that distinction does not exist. So we decided to merge layout and background into one department. So, and it has its challenges because they're both departments that have their own deadlines and they're you using the same people for different things. So we have a larger team, but they do layout first and then they go on to do the background color. None at all. I would say 60% of the crew is from outside of Spain. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of European talent. A lot of, I mean, you can hear Italian, French, and German, Polish, and all kinds of languages in the studio. We have a few people coming over from the US or from Canada or from South America too. Fair amount of work visas that had to get, you uh, know, just to get a team. I mean, you've seen the proof of concept that we did, and you know that achieving that level at a feature level is not going to be easy so we had to get very choosy and we could we had to find the talent wherever it was you know and a lot of times it was about betting on on guys who maybe don't have a lot of experience but like we're giving the training we'll help them out we have good leadership right now it's custom but it, we've proven that it's it works well within a pipeline it adds the lighting pass in top of the um, you know, it jumps it between ink and paint and combo essentially, right? But then the 2D pipeline is far simpler than the 3D pipeline, so you can afford that and more, right? Um, I would say that um, I would love to see it happening, but I would love for people to emulate the thinking that took us to where we are rather than the actual look of the film, right? Like I wish like what people took away from it, 2D has something to offer if you take the time to get experiment and play around with it and bring something new and original, right? I, I got lucky to happen to be surrounded by people that could figure it out. Like, this is not my merit. This was just, I would say, uh, you know, a lot of coincidence. Like, I, I was looking for people who could help me out with this, and it turns out the one that figured out was the guy who was sitting next door. But I didn't know that at the time, right? So it, it, it a lot of it is fortune. You got to decide to look and to put time and effort into it, you know? But I also think there was a, this notion that the, the, the way to bring back traditional animation was through nostalgia. And I think that's a mistake. There's a nostalgic quality to these things, but just saying to people, remember this? It's just not enough, right? You gotta bring something new. I realized that if I write and direct, I can apply my knowledge as an animator as well. So if you control the story and the way we deliver it, you can say, well, I am fully aware of how much information you can deliver through just performance animation. So I don't need to write this. I can instruct my animators to animate the subtext of the shot. And then it became very liberating because I could say, well, I can, I, can, I can make sure the audience gets it without ever saying it. I can, I can get, make them part of figuring out the story, which is the way to get them engaged. I learned a lot about, about like how to measure how much information I deliver, uh, how do I convey emotion best, you know? And um, so all those things were surprises to me. And I, my team was definitely surprised because they tell me every time you pitch me something, you spend more, more time on the subtext than you do on the actual text. I'm like, that's how it's written. And you should enjoy it because you don't get to do this much. That means you get to carry the truth of the character, you know? Uh, the, that's the most fun I had animating characters when they actually were 
not meaning what they were saying. Yes, that's the most fun to anime because you get to actually get that, uh, you know, you have to make that come across. And it's difficult, but it's super rewarding if you do it right, you know. So the film is plastered with, with a lot of uh, uh, solutions that are performance-based as opposed to dialogue-based, for example, right?